Let me pause.
net of the rotary club. Dad and I have raised his hand, Eric Larson. He is the president of the Life for the Rotary Club. We had a um, dinner the other night at Charlie's Irish Pub out for our Creek. Fantastic place. And we happened to be there on trivia night. So Dad had the great idea of, oh, we should do some rotary trivia. Uh, and on the screen, as we walk in, you'll see a question, and we'll go look at that question in a minute. So it's about where and when the first Rotary Club was chartered. So be thinking about that. So again, welcome. Please follow us on social media. We are on all the major socials, including YouTube. Make sure you do that. And wanted to say a big thank you to Tobacco Road. This is on the fantastic spread of great thing. We are so grateful to be here. Um, Hope everybody found it okay and uh, found parking as well. Is, did everybody park in the deck? Just raise your hands if you did it. Okay, great. And you probably had to swipe your card when you went in. On the way out, there's going to be little tickets kind of the size of Monopoly money on your table. What you'll do is you'll swipe your card one, one more time and then swipe the barcode that's on the ticket on the way out. So make sure you grab one of those, do your credit card first, and then do that ticket and the parking money. So, so before we get into any more business, it's time for Tommy to do the invitation. Okay, it's New Preston. It's a great, great time to be here. Good day to be a Rotarian. So, you guys bow your heads for some invitation. Father, thank you for bringing us all together here as Rotarians. Thank you for the abundance of leadership that takes place in this club, not just today, but folks who've been here for years and decades, putting in their time and talent and service, making this so special. We thank you specifically, this club's uh, blessed today to have three past district governors on hand, which is a very rare thing, many, many past presidents in the room. We just thank you for this place, for the people that are hosting us today, for the hard work that's coming on their end, make this food delicious, this place beautiful. We thank you for the work that Rotary does worldwide, not just here in Rotary, but for everybody that's worked hard to be part of this group that we make this possible in their lives. Father, that's us in your name. Amen. 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 Could you please rise for me? I pledge allegiance to the United States of America.
Uh, it's not a nice break of your board. Like that. First of the about 110 McNally's Okay, on to our new segment. Happy for the new record. <laughs> Realize. <laughs> <laughs> Rotary trivia. Does anybody have an answer? Where was the first club at university? Um, and at what year was the first club chartered by Rotary International? Yes. Past district governor, thank you. Thank you. University of North Carolina at Charlotte in 1968. And then it was followed by, and Nathan, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was followed by some clubs, international club, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Right here. Room one. Um, John, we did not see him. John is not here, but he visited the Rotary Club of Duluth, Minnesota, and one of our visiting guests, what the Rotary does. Is when ever you are out of town and there's a local Rotary Club, you're encouraged to go visit. And when you visit, you bring a flag from your club. This is our Rotary Club of Broadway flag. And you do a banner exchange with the club you're visiting. So there's John. He is in the right and first picture. And he's meeting on a really cool Jose of Rotary International, um, exchanging the Rotary Club of Broadway flag. So I would bring these and come with the same grab flags each week. If you were going out of town and you'll visit a club, please grab one. Do a banner exchange. It's a really fun thing to go to Rotary or Rotary. At upcoming meeting today, we have a great speaker, Mitchell Whitley, who's going to talk about his travels through North Carolina. Next week, we have a professor from NC State, um, retired professor from NC State, who spent an entire year in the dry valleys of Antarctica. He's going to talk about his book. Then we have our husband, James Lamancha, who just switched his membership to our club or the New York club. Talk about Gift of Life International, which provides life saving heart surgeries to children across the world. And then on July 31st, we have another Christian NC State, Lover NC State Connections, Michael Bustle, and he's going to be talking about CSU um, local training initiative. And that is where they do, um, they teach classes overseas, Japan, China, Saudi Arabia, other places in South America, and how that works out, that can be fascinating. So on the table, um, you will see some cards, and I mentioned it on June 26th. This is an initiative to reach out to your fellow Rotarians um, if you have a, a story of, of something that is, and then we're even going to be in the middle or you haven't seen a Rotarian in a while. Um, and you just want to reach out and say, hey, I love getting letters in the mail from friends. Um, so I thought it'd be fun with our theme of creating hope in the world to um, spread some hope amongst our membership. So if you feel so inclined to write a letter to another Rotarian, take one of us home. You can find other members' addresses on DAC TV. Um, or if you don't want to do that, you can drop them on the little basket on the table and we will find the address um, for you and mail them. So I'm hoping to get a hundred of those sent out this year. Um, so please think about doing that. It's, it's really fun. I don't know about you, but again, it's really fun to get some personal letters in the mail. So um, I know you all have noticed there has been a dues increase in Tom. Um, and his bulletins has described the reasoning behind that. And um, we're going to increase the news by $15 a quarter 
just to cover our food costs and um, the increased costs of everything basically over the last um, five, six, seven years. We have not increased due significantly since 2015. We have just done a $10 increase. That was at the beginning of two, last year, right, Tom? But yeah. Um, so you'll see this $15 increase every quarter. You saw it in your July bill. And then by April 1st, 2024, it'll be 270 a quarter. Um, junior memberships will keep on doing their incremental third, then two thirds of full dues. E membership will be just a flat $10 increase. So come talk to me, anybody on the board, if you have any questions about that, we can explain them further. Okay, we're going to skip nosy me for next week, but we're going to have a good one, or this week, but we'll have a good one next week. It is time for the wrap. If you bought a raffle ticket today, thank you very much. I'm glad you're all here. We're a special class that you bought a raffle ticket. All right. You have a ticket? All right. Charlie, would you pick a winner? Yeah. Copy by all means, please. Thank you. 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 Today's number number eight zero zero two zero eight five. Eight two one five. Congratulations, Bill. Okay, Richard. Eber your service chair did not be here today, but we had a very successful um, no woman, no girl service project that he delivered all of the items collected um, to their headquarters last Friday. And he had a goal of 2,000 items, and it was really exciting to report that he had, he had almost 2,500 items donated for this project. And again, these items are basic toiletries that are going to go be distributed to local women and girls who do not have access to that. So these women and girls can go to jobs every day, go to school every day, not have to worry about missing that, missing the school work days. So um, thank you so much for everybody who donated. Where's the Eric starting one? Oh, right there. Um, Eric and um, Trio Senior Living put together about like three, four big crates. That Rachel said were filled to the brim with items. I think he mentioned he picked one up and the entire bottom fell out of this. <laughs> so he um, picked out a lot. But also, Josh, thank you guys so much. Um, that's really going to make an impact in the community. Our July service project is coming up this weekend. July 15th, it's a Habitat for Humanity build. And um, we have been doing these builds several times a year. Um, I have never made one before, and I've been assured by countless members multiple times I don't make any candy. So hopefully nobody gives me a hand or anything. <laughs> I'm just painting or anything. So no worries if you're not handy. There's still plenty of slots to sign up for. Um, go to our website for the sign up link and consider coming out um, to do that on Saturday. It should be a really great time talking to Kevin. Um, who else is into a habitat bill? Anybody that's raising their hands um, and talk about it with them, it should be a really um, great, great service project. All right, we are ready for membership. Hello, hello, hello you, libertarians. Thank you so much for coming out uh, today to our new space. It's an awesome. It's really cool coming in and seeing that in the uh, uh, so, uh, as, a, as a new year, uh, there are a few things that we'll have to go over for membership. Uh, today, we also have a couple of first readings and, and a second reading. Uh, so, Eric, if you go ahead and come on up live and do the first reading for, uh, for Cindy. Uh, today, we first have a first reading for Cindy Barry about Pharma. She is sponsored by our own in the Southern, and she is a senior vice president and commercial relationship manager at Encore Bank. She wasn't able to be here today, but I look forward to having her at our next meeting. We'll do a little bit more of a, a team brief with her and hear why she's talking about more further interest. Um, but next, we have Eric Sopper, um, as you already heard a little bit about today. Eric is being sponsored by Tiffany Harmony. Uh, it's his second reading today, uh, and Eric has 
everybody who has already heard about it asked why rotary? It's not too much money for rotary and the rotary for the problem. Sure. Uh, first, thank you for uh, having me. I'm really excited. Um, I came from Livermore, California, about four years ago. Livermore is not a tiny little town, but it's about 400,000 people shy of what we're all being at. Uh, <laughs> a little difference there. Um, so, if they are high resources, senior living to, you know, directly reach out to a lot of uh, people who are uh, involved. Since coming to Raleigh, it was a little more difficult for me, you know, stranger in a strange land, lots of things going on, COVID, lots of excuses, right? Um, and I'm just excited that Rotary is just going to give me an, an opportunity to utilize the resources I have at Rio Senior Living to, to help the, uh, the Raleigh community. Um, I happen to work for a company that really believes in philanthropy and kind of lives by it. Um, we have a, a, a breakers lifestyle motto, you know, it's family, community, and network. So you take care of those first two things, the third one's going to fall right apart. So, um, lots of, uh, lots of reasons to, to be excited about it. And there's a lot of wonderful things. Park service for exactly the screen inside the having part of uh, the roof of uh, So, yeah, uh, if you've got any questions or haven't had an opportunity to be there, say hello to Matt McGee. Thank you. All right, more things to go over real quick. Uh, first, we've got a couple of pictures. I think they're in the next slide. Yes. As you can see, we had a successful service social over at the Arctic over the North Hills. Um, it was our farewell to Tom as his final service social uh, as president. Uh, it was well attended. So thank you all for coming out there. Uh, details for our next service social will be coming up soon. So we'll be looking out for that and make sure to work on the calendar. And then we also had a really great, I mean, last, last time I was up here, I said that we were having the party of the year. I the party of the decade. Uh, we have 13 new members to send on Tom Packer's house. Uh, the, the good thing about having uh, the attorney as your, your president is that when the, the police were called to our house, we had the anyways, we didn't talk to him on each other. We had a really good time. It was great to see the energy, excitement, and engagement from these new members. Uh, so thank you to all of you that came out. Uh, it's going to be a great year. Uh, and then to finish it off, we had 24 new members total last year. Uh, that's a huge step. Everybody needs to I'm going to you all take a, take a quick second to look around. The stages are pretty much already filled on our first meeting here. There's a lot of room to grow. So continue to share your why. A lot of need in our community, and so we're going to need more members to, to make it that. So before we do birthdays and anniversaries, I messed up on my very first meeting and um, forgot to ask the most important people in the room, our distinguished guests, to introduce themselves. So I'm going to go table by table, and we're going to start over here with the table in the back where we have a very, very distinguished guest, past district governor. Can you stand up, Raven? Introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Nathan Thomas. Been the neighborhood area from probably the town club just up the road. Excited to share the first what week and a half of every year with all of you. And good luck, Gary. It's a good year. Leave at the next table over a panel of lizard. You're also a um, visiting Rotarian. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm a member of the Southeast Raleigh Satellite Club. The satellite the secretary the last three years, and also under District Governor Nathan Thomas, I have been with an innovative club in Ashton and Harris and wherever. Can you talk about the impact of this, this group? So we'll have to have that conversation. Uh, Pamela, when is your first meeting for the year? I'm sorry, uh, your club? Yes. Okay. Y'all, um, and you meet on Zoom, right? Yes. Okay. If you have to, um, if you have been to a meeting yet, I really highly recommend going to a Southeast Raleigh meeting as they are our Southeast Club. They do great things in the Southeast Raleigh community. Thank you, Pamela. Almost all women, we have to like trauma them. <laughs> 
Jennifer, you had a desk, right? This is Leslie Richmond with Special Olympics. Hi, Leslie Richmond. Um, thank you guys for letting me join your today. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I am the volunteer engagement director with Special Olympics North Carolina, uh, stationed in Morrisville. So, love to get to have an opportunity to talk to some of you guys and see how we might be able to get you involved in helping support um, Special Olympics. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller Period, and then yes, thank you, Leslie, for checking this out. Um, birthdays, we have three birthdays this week. Seven Smith is her birthday is today. Kevin Summer, he did a happy dog for his birthday. He is here Goldie. I saw well, there you go. This is a happy birthday. Um, Randy and Susan Woodson, Chancellor Randy, um, here at the University of Mississippi, and Jim and Lynn Norset. And I believe they're on travel somewhere celebrating your just this. Oh, hi, Jim. Happy anniversary. <laughs> so that brings us to our fantastic speaker for the day, Mitchell Whitley, who is going to talk to us about his journey across the state, meeting all of the mayors of North Carolina and where he's gotten to on those travels. But before he comes up here, I'll read um, a bio of him and then a little bit about his. Mitchell Whitley is a Greensboro native and a proud first generation college student on his father's side of the family. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Stanford University, which is in Alabama, Stanford, where he graduated Magna Law in 2021. After spending the last six years working in different political capacities for North Carolina, he felt a calling to go further when it came to being active for and in his state. Being an Eagle Scout, Mitchell has always practiced not staying aware of ways to improve his local, not only staying aware of ways to improve his local community, but for ways to personally build up all those around him. He started thinking about a project to learn what makes all 551 North Carolina community special, two, listen firsthand as to what issues every single citizen is facing, and three, publish a book to raise awareness and make a difference for all North Carolinians. And just like that, Mitchell's marriage was born. Outside of spending every weekend on the road, Mitchell works for a nonprofit in Raleigh, helping North Carolina, North Carolina high school students find workforce training and educational opportunities. His personal passions include traveling, of course, fencing, running, camping, reading, watching movies, collecting political memorabilia, and spending time with family and writing. Once the Mitchell Nearest Made by Tour is complete, Mitchell plans to write a book on the full experience, which you'll have to come back and tell us about. And uh, experience sharing the amazing events he got to be a part of and the interesting stories he learned. He would like you to always remember everything he sees big, big or small, should truly matter to us all. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Mitchell up to the movie. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for allowing me to be here in front of such a great audience. I mean, y'all are some of the uh, best and, and brightest leaders in Wake County and here in Raleigh, of course. So it means a lot to be able to be here in front of you and speak about my statewide tour that I do with my dad on weekends. So who am I? I know you've heard a little bit, but we get into a little bit more. So I was born, born and bred native of the Gate City of Greensboro, where my folks still live today. Uh, but currently live in the northwest part of Raleigh now, working for nonprofit. And a first generation college student on my dad's side of the family, uh, where I went to Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm a 2016 Eagle Scout, an avid outdoorsman, traveler, and recently fencer at the Apex Fencing Academy. I wanted to try something new, so I thought I'd just try the fencing because of uh, And graduated, of course, like I said, from Sanford University, Birmingham, Alabama. So what is Mitchell's Mayors? What is this project about sky, traveling the state, helping the municipal leaders of the week? I mean, wouldn't you rather be hanging out with his friends, you know, playing video games? But I've always had a calling across North Carolina to make a difference for everyone. And even in Alabama, there's a school down there. Making a difference, listening for people is always important to me. 
So I was a political science major in college, and I had internships in D.C., in North Carolina, here uh, campaigns locally, but there was always something missing in each of those opportunities. And that was a true emphasis on the individuality of our communities across the state, especially our small towns. You know, you always hear conversations about what's happening in our big cities, which is awesome. But raise your hand if you've ever heard about the town of Kings or North Carolina. Or raise your hand if you've heard of Wayland. So there's a couple of people. But our smallest of communities, a lot of people I've never even heard of or been to or visited. And so for me, I want to find a way to shout these communities out and give them a chance to highlight what they're doing and the stories of their mayors. So I thought, how can I be a good advocate? For even our smallest of communities. And it was time that somebody listened and learned to all 551 towns across North Carolina. But who should I talk to? Who should I go and speak with to get their story about the community? Because I could go door to door in every town. That would take quite a lot of time. So I thought about our mayor's invention and realized that almost all mayor elections across the state are nonpartisan elections, which I feel like those people could bring a great, great perspective on what's been done to help everyone in the community. And even the towns that do have partisan municipal elections, those mayors still who are dedicated to listening to everybody and making a positive difference. And then I eventually asked my dad, you want to come along with me and make this a father-son statewide tour? My dad's 63 and he works for NCDOT and inspects hybrid projects for the week. But on the weekends, he said, you know what? That sounds like a great idea. Let's get the road together. And uh, my mom allows him to come with me uh, most weekends. Some weekends she needs to hold the back, but he loves coming with me. And boom, just like that, Mitch's mayor was born. And uh, there I am with the mayor of Oakland on a wooden sailboat ride. And there I am with uh, my hometown mayor, Nancy Farm, in uh, Greensboro. So, in many towns have my dad not visited? Well, since September of 2021, we've traveled to over 221 cities across North Carolina. And as of today, we've interviewed 236 mayors across the state. So, not quite halfway, there's 551 total, so we have a ways to go. But 236 mayors with such amazing individual stories, uh, exciting things happening in all of our towns, important things going on that you wouldn't know about unless you took the time to go visit. With a total of five, there's still quite a ways to go. But what makes the towns across our state so different? You know, what, what makes them have individuality compared to just being the same? Well, of course, how each one came to be, whether it be built by textile, manufacturing, farming, or simply the scenic qualities. I mean, a lot of towns you go to, especially in the northeast part of the state or somewhere in the east part of the state where you get to the beach, they were all built by the state. They were all built by the agriculture infrastructure that has gone to bay for the most part. But the mayors are still striving to reinvigorate their towns, to build new ideas, to bring more people in. Or if it was textile, or it's for a kind of mills, or other towns that had a river nearby, well, they would the factory, and that put everyone in the town. Many of them are still alive today and retired. You can tell stories of days of old working in the textile facilities. The local population, of course, can be different. Families who have resided for generations on a new basis who have moved in from out of state. And then, of course, the location, location, location. The mountains, Piedmont, Sand Hills, and the East Coast, and everywhere in between. Each of these almost divisions of North Carolina are so different, but all of them have mayors who have decided to make a positive difference across the entire state. So, our largest versus our smallest community visits, Fontana Dam and Village only has 13 registered residents, <laughs> while Raleigh has 470,000. So, we, Charlotte is the only big city we haven't been to yet. So, if anybody knows where they're made, Charlotte Mayor would be willing to help me uh, get into kind of me and kind of other help. Uh, but uh, so Raleigh's the biggest city that we've met. Uh, so, where can the NC improve? What can we do better across the state? Because, you know, traveling the state and learning from every mayor, you really come to understand what our state needs, you know, not just looking at data and numbers, but being in their boots on the ground, per se, in every community to understand what's happening. And that's what we did. So our state's issues are very far and wide. Things like invading the bugs and boats and bun are local areas. So the mayor, both of those mayors are talking about the issues they were having where buzzing were terrorizing the town and actually attacking people and then turning over trash cans. And so in the town of Bunn, which I may have read this article before, but they actually built a cannon on top of a high school that shoots off at 12 every day, like an air cannon that apparently scares them off. But in the town of Coates, they had to hire a federal person to kill one, and they hung it upside down on the water tower for seven days. So when you drove in the town, you saw a bird hanging off the water tower. 
uh, the very scary rest of them all. So anyway, those are more locally based issues. Again, you wouldn't know about it. Time to go talk to people and hear what's going on. But there are trending patterns as far as we have to address. And in doing my project, I hope that legislators can learn about it and see what we need to put our focus on. Now, I'm not a lobbyist, of course, I don't try to lobby, but this project to get people excited about making the policy change across our state. Where can we focus to make a difference? So, our three main things that we always hear about in the state, every single town we go to number one, water and sewer energy. Many of y'all may know, but our water and sewer infrastructure is so expensive to fix or to change. Many of our towns still have terracotta pipes and don't have the money to, you know, right away fix everything in the community. They have to save up money and do it road by road, you know, maybe once every two, three years. And everyday people say, why can't we just do it now? Well, a lot of our towns don't have the money to do it. And the bigger cities may have more funding to be able to do projects like that, but it still is a big expense to put money on the side of the paper. But for me, the biggest thing that concerns me is that some towns even have wood pipes. They don't even have terracotta. They have wood pipes from the water pipes, water and sewer pipes, because they don't have the money to fix it. So to me, being able to stand up for an issue like that is important that I can hopefully get people to pay attention to and make a difference for them. Number two is roads. Roads, of course, are another big expense, and having to improve those, repave it, do any kind of road work takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And for a lot of towns to be able to successfully grow, they got to have good road infrastructure. And so, any of our smaller towns that want to grow that need to repave the roads, they don't have the money to do it. And then, last one, affordable housing. You know, homes are growing everywhere across our state. It's amazing to see it. But we also got to make sure, too, that the local people here in North Carolina. Or to buy and live in their community, not have to move out. There have been some towns to go to where generations of families had to move away because they couldn't afford to buy a home where the tax revaluation that we've done in their county has skyrocketed because so they're not able to afford it. So, anyway, taking a look at the more affordable housing, finding ways to work with developers in order to make our homes affordable for everyday North Carolinians, too, is really important. In 2023, the main things like we should already be solved. So, I'm proud to be an advocate for evidence on issues just like these. So there's myself with Mayor East Spencer, which they're doing a lot of things in the community, working directly with the developer. And then that is downtown Williamson, where they're actually expanding the sidewalk to make it more walking friendly rather than a So people will enjoy the uh, downtown work. But again, they have to save a lot of money up to go pay for road So along with the municipal work across the state, you also learn a lot of amazing stories from the mayors. You know, they're you think of a municipal leader, oh, they're just their local person, and they've been there for years, and they just somehow got involved and became mayor, and that's it. Well, a lot of times that's not the case. A lot of times people have incredible stories or incredible connections to things in history that you never go about unless you took the time to go visit and sit down with them and say, tell me your story. Tell me what is important to you. Tell me where you come from, what you like doing. So these are some of my best favorites. So the mayor of Middleton, North Carolina, Halifax, there was a Bigfoot museum and hunts for Bigfoot on the weekends with his friends. So I know that sounds kind of crazy. Why would somebody do that? Well, his story is really amazing. I think that's a picture right there. We go. There, there's me and him. We're holding one of his Bigfoot footprints that he casts, and uh, he's got a statue of his museum right there. Uh, the mayor is from up in New York and was a journalist for a long time. And one of the New York Daily Globe or whatever the newspaper names were called, but he got to interview uh, uh, celebrities. He did serial killer cases, like all this corruption cases, all this really cool stuff that he got to write about and publish the newspaper up north. He told us the story we got to interview Madonna and her son Rocco when she fell off the horse and the anthem. It's like all kinds of cool things that you got to do. But eventually he wanted to move down south to a wider town. And I think he had a family connection here in Littleton. But for him, always trying to always trying to mention it because this gets people excited was what he loves to do. So when he came to Littleton, he learned about the history of Bigfoot sightings and the people have always said they've seen them. So he started the museum, he started going hunting himself for Bigfoot. I mean, all kinds of things he has in the museum that has actually driven more people to the town. The restaurant has, has a Bigfoot brew, another restaurant has a Bigfoot burger with patties about this big. I mean, it's huge. We got that needed with the mayor. But because of his genius thinking and just the time he took to really reinvigorate the end of the town, they're growing again in the community. And he also told us, too, he said, I'm not Bigfoot, but just let me know. But be warned, you're out where a bulletproof helmet is big with those rocks. So he had some in his office that he could 
mayor of the country with this big bed that's going to rock So, anyway, okay, maybe we will, we are maybe we won't, but uh, anyway, so that stuff is going to sit in a private mercury capsule used by John and other astronauts to first orbit the Earth during the space race when we first learned. Mm -hmm. And you may be thinking, how would you do that? Did you travel to NASA? Now I travel to a place in North Carolina, the town of Monroe, uh, where the mayor uh, took me to the new science museum, where NASA landed this capsule on display because, I don't know if you've all seen the movie Hidden Figures, but some of the African-American women who were the first to help with NASA and their space program, one of those women was from Monroe. And she lived there, grew up there. And work for NASA, but because of that, they wouldn't think that they told her story at the museum for kids to learn at the space museum. So NASA said, Hey, we will lend you this uh, capsule on display that was used by the astronauts so kids can see it and understand it. And they were setting it up, and the mayor asked if they wanted to climb inside because the museum was closed. We took them there after hours. I said, uh, Yeah, I'd love to climb inside. So I got to be a piece of world history, all because I took the time to go learn from somebody and sit down and say, share me your story, tell me about your town, what's going on here. You got to sit in the space capital. It was really small, but it was really small. Oh, oh, sorry, that's not. Here we go. Okay, so the next one is one of my favorites. So the town of St. James is near the South Border. I don't know if anyone's ever been there before, but it's a very, uh, it's, about 9,000 people, but it's just a private community of like five country clubs that spends all the weekend. So it's really interesting to think that that could be a town, but there are some things like across the state. But the mayor of St. James, when we were interviewing her and talking to her, she said, Oh, yeah, the land was part of the Manhattan Project during World War II, which, as you may not know, that was the project built the first atomic bomb, the secret project that was going on during World War II. Well, her dad was from, uh, I think he was from Illinois or Indiana, but he grew up on a farm. He was just 21 years old. He was great with numbers. He loved science and math. And so he somehow got involved with the project and was sent to work in an underground lab at the University of Chicago, building the two spheres that the plutonium bomb would go inside of. And so he's there working on it. And whenever he would want to leave, though, he'd have to be tailed by the FBI to the FBI to make sure he wouldn't you know, tell any secrets or anything. But he's, remember, he's a young, he's a far kid. He wants to go you know, have his own fun. He doesn't have to have two guys all on the ground. So we go down to downtown Chicago. We go sit at the bar, and he looked at the guy's right and said, "Hey, how are you?" Looked the guy's left and said, "Hey, how are you?" And get up and leave. But the other guy was afraid all to have to interview those guys for like twenty minutes, and he could lose his tail and get out of there and go you know, for the rest of the evening. I to think that. Um, yeah. She now here in North Carolina, leading little difference was inspiring to me. But it gets even crazier. So a few months later, we went to the town of Pittsburgh, and the mayor there was speaking to her. She just casually mentions, Oh, yeah, my dad was part of the Manhattan Project uh, during World War II. I said, Wow, that's crazy. She came So I said, Where did you She said, You worked underground at the University of Chicago on the project. I said, Oh, my gosh, no way. I thought the mayor's dad did too. She went right now. She said, How crazy that it just so happens. The two mayor's dads, one mayor's family is from like Illinois and Indiana, and the other is from New York. No minimal connection at all. But they just so happen to have working to problem together on my patent project. And now the daughters are both mayors here in North Carolina that I met while they were in office. Hey, it's a great idea. If you take the time to talk to people and listen to their story, you learn some amazing things that they're excited to share with you. We've also got to drive a mayor of his life in the 1970 Buick Electra 225. My dad told me these, we call it Houston Quarter. So we got to drive the mayor, this giant convertible. This thing is huge. And we got to drive him the Christmas parade where he came from in their small town of Atkins in North Carolina, where you know, it was just a quick five minute drive down the main strip of town. But it did so much to the people in the community that new faces were there, excited to see their town, their small little town that doesn't have a lot of growth. It's in the middle of the country, but we were excited to go see it and get involved. There was a chance like this to drive a man and drive the Christmas parade. How cool is that? We also too learned in the town of Garrettsburg, North Carolina, there's actually a full size steam locomotive buried underground in the dirt on the side of the road. Now, you think, how in the world did that happen? They just bury a train underground. Well, the old lines tell that they always talk about the town for many, many, many decades. Was that all the others training buried in the ground? Well, fast forward 
maybe six years ago or so, DOT was changing some grass sign the road. They were uh, monitoring under the ground to make sure there's no gas on the right there. And they see the shape of an object, but they leave it in the ground as a full steam locomotive that's just buried in the dirt. But then they realize the local history of the story and realize it's true. Well, what they found out looking in the history books is that in the county, they were moving the train tracks from one side of Perrysburg to the other. And this one steam locomotive wouldn't work. It, it stopped working. And then instead of just taking it apart, they just decided to dig a giant hole and pull it into the hole and just bury dirt on top. That was the guy who did anything else with well, the whole story was that, yeah, they used mules to pull it into the hole, and that was it. Well, the truth that they found out more recently is that the state actually back then still leased the convicts of private companies to do work for them. And so, mind you, this is really 1900s when this happened. So, it was convicts that had to pull this locomotive by rope into the hole and then bury it back in the ground. So, now the mayor's raising money to dig it up out of the ground and put it in the museum. So, how long that they think this community? To draw more people in, because the is a small community, not a lot going on. But the mayor, he's so excited to get involved with this project. I listen to you call me. As soon as you that first job with Randy Khan, my dad and I didn't come down because we'd be excited to be a publisher. We also too met mayors who uh, helped in the Cold War in both Pine Hill Shores in the town of Shiloh. So in Pine Hill Shores, the mayor there is uh, Mayor John Brown, and he's a really, really guy. I don't know if y'all ever been to Pine Hill Shores, but you may know what it is. It's just a small beach and community. There's no real commercial industry. It's just a house and the condos. But my grandfather has a place there, so I spent many years there and much time there. But, but the mayor he told us his story about how he ended up being one of the heads from, at the Department of Energy in like the 80s and then into the 90s. And he was born, he had offices in London, Saudi Arabia, France. All of the world to travel to to meet these world leaders in energy policy in the United States. But he told us that one of his duties eventually was he was in charge of getting all the nuclear missiles of the former Soviet Union when they fell. He was sent over there and helped break all these nuclear missiles of the Soviet Union over to these uh, other countries that you know left the Union, getting all those missiles out where they've been, I'm not sure, but they took them all out. And then he helped teach those new nations how to do their own energy policy. So thanks to him, he helped change the world. I mean, he helped at the end of the Cold War and teaching countries how to be self-sustaining. And if he, if he hadn't done it, maybe some else would have it again. Because in North Carolina, we can see here now, he's just trying to retire at the age, but he just casually tells a story like this. And I'm like, sir, that's a big deal. He's like, it's, it's nothing. I just was serving our country. Uh, so again, a great story to learn. And then in the town of Shalom, we met the mayor there who told us how he would say, Back during the late 60s and in the 70s, he worked with men and rockets and was out in the uh, Midwest living in underground bunkers where they had to be ready in 60 seconds or less to fire off an ICBM during the Cold War if it came down to that. So he told us stories of living underground and how the bunkers they would build had some kind of elasticity to it to where if they had an impact or something, it would like almost their, their underground facility would somehow you know, not bounce, but, you know, sustain well in under the surface so it wouldn't just crumble. Anyway, an amazing story to learn uh, from him that he just, again, a small town mayor, but he helped the world history and helped to prevent a nuclear war in the United States. And then a few other stories that I'll share, since he hasn't time, they're not on the uh, thing here. Just this past weekend, we met the mayor of Belmont. He told us, that's what we're you know, this weekend, he told us that he was on one of the destroyers, it was the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis Blockade. And he was on the destroyer, they could see the enemy ships across, just not one from them, and could see it. And they all, that he talked about how they could all feel the tension. I mean, they were afraid that the world was about to end. It was, they said it was the scariest moment of his entire life. He never met somebody that was involved that before. And to hear that story from him and to learn, you know, I'm, only, I'm 24 years old. And my dad is 63, he can reminisce on some of these stories and talk about them, but to live in the history for somebody that was actually there is a whole nother thing. And I love doing it with this time. Another story I'll share is, uh, and I'm guessing on the World War trend here, uh, Grandfather Village, which is right next to Grandfather Mountain, it's another country club in Kimberly. That mayor, his stepdad, uh, turned out after they were able to get Freedom of Information Act through FOIA and get more going. They found out that his stepdad was in the CIA and was sent as a, uh, not a fake general, but sent down to Cuba when Castro first took over. 
and would meet with him and try and make negotiations and all this other stuff. And uh, it was also involved, I don't know what degree, but the Bay of Pigs invasion and, and you know, just crazy to think that a mayor's stepdad was involved again in world history, making a positive difference for our nation or whether we talk about what. But anyway, very interesting story. Oops, hold on. So, my final thoughts and a call to action for each and every one of you is for me, making sure every single North Carolinian feels heard and appreciated is so vital, especially today. And even in a world where there's a lot of division and a lot of times it's hard to come together over things. But I feel like a project like this is something that people can sit together, share stories, learn about, and really enjoy hearing about it. It's kind of just bring communities together, all of our communities across the state. Folks, whether it be the metropolis of Toronto or the tiny community away from it, everywhere in between, they all make North Carolina the special place that it is today. And without them, we wouldn't be where we are. So, my call to action for you all is each and every day, you don't have to meet all the mayors in North Carolina, but take the time to meet somebody new around you, maybe somebody that works in your same office or your next door neighbor that you've never spoken to. Take the time to hear somebody's story and say, I don't get to know you. What's your story? Where are you from? You know, what got you excited to be working where you are? What makes you live in North Carolina? Because you never know if they help build an atomic bomb or have to get rid of a dead guy tail or bury the tree in the ground. Or maybe they just need some help with some. Maybe they just need a prayer of the day or good words of encouragement. And that can mean a lot to people when you take the time to do that. So our state is somebody who's willing to visit all 551 towns because then and only then can one truly say that I know what a great state needs and what the people need to have better lives. And that's why I do this project. Because change comes from more than just behind a desk. It comes from physical activity in one's community or one's entire state. So please never forget this most so important mantra that I should have ever wanted to eat is that every instance in big or small truly matters to us all. And that's my dad. Up there. So how can we help? Well, this is Mayor's going to be a project for my full-time job. So if you have any interest in any and all of you want to support the project, we have a good one to pay to raise my help, pay for gas, my eventual book publication. But also, to be sure to go to my website, our social media accounts, where you can follow along and check out all the pictures of the mayors, read some of the stories yourself, and watch the news clips, too. Because we've been on Spectrum News with Tim Boyan. We have a... Uh, a bunch of other smaller lists been on podcasts because again it's just important to me to share the stories of our mayors, share the stories of our towns, and share the amazing projects that are going on. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for allowing me to speak here about my mayor's project. I hope you wrote some of the stories. I've got plenty more. So if you ever want to call and just talk about them and hear more stories, I can talk about them all day. So again, thank you all for what you do with your community and for allowing me to be here today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. September of 2021. So about a year and ten months, or a year and eight months, something. Like that. You know, people always ask me, like, "Don't you want to just get done as soon as you can, or do you have a timeline?" And for me, I don't really have a specific timeline in mind. I'm still trying to figure out myself when it will be done. I mean, obviously, get almost halfway. It's taken around, you know, over a year, obviously. But I don't want my experience with other mayors to take as much time as it needs. You know, one mayor we spent 45 minutes with because they had something else to go do. Another mayor we spent 12 hours with because he had to set behind his house in the mountains. We wouldn't have to get a hotel. But anyway, I just want towns to feel like I took the time to truly understand their community and their mayor's story and not just run into an experience that kind of make it seem like I'm only there for 10 years. Because I'm not, I'm there to learn, I'm there to listen, I'm there to experience the local culture in every community. So, timeline, not exactly sure. Maybe the next few years I'll get it done, but it also depends on the rate I can get scheduled for all the some, some are harder to get more done than others, and some are really easy. Yes, ma'am. How are you choosing which towns to go to? <laughs> well, when I first started the project, I just kind of was just all over the place. I was calling up towns and mountains at the beach, and I was lining up, you know, one weekend we'd be going to the mountains, and the very next weekend we'd have to go straight down to the beach and spend the night. And as I bitch this a little bunch. But uh, if we scale it back a little bit, maybe do like one longer trip in you know, once a month. So this year in 2023, I definitely take a lot more time trying to go elsewhere from whether it be where my folks live in Greensboro, whether it be here in Raleigh. Go out with from there and further and further travel. So, like I mentioned, we've been with all the big city mayors already. 
uh, all of them except for Charlotte. So still working in that one. We were in Fayetteville, the Greensboro, we met with Mayor Crawley, uh, Winston-Salem, one of those great big towns, Asheville. So, uh, but yeah, I kind of just choose it right now based around the closest I can to get those. And then, of course, the latter part will be with the further out. Yes, sir. Is the recent infrastructure bill helping any of the communities that uh, you've been talking to? That's a good question. And mayors haven't specifically spoken on that themselves. But I do know that one thing that helps them is grants. And so a lot of the towns that are able to afford a manager or town manager or town clerk are able to get a lot of grants and put it up and get some money from that. And also, to the heart of the American Rescue Plan funds, that's been another thing they've talked about where they've gotten extra funding to do local projects. So that is a good question, though, and I'm excited. I'm actually going to ask them sorry, yeah. I'm going to start asking you that question because that's a good point to talk about. Because if it's not, you know, what can we change to make it better? So thank you for bringing that to my attention. So I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Planning to publish all of the stories. <laughs> that's, that's another question people ask me. You know, if I did a, a 551 page town or 551 town book, I mean, that'd be one megaton, right? And so I'm trying to figure out. First of all, how to train the writing of the story. And number two, if it's going to be a series, if it's going to be, you know, multiple, like almost textbook style, because I want to really make it be about this being a father son statewide tour. Because my dad, you know, growing up, he was working, he worked, uh, he didn't get to go to college and he worked on in a hands on job, which was great for him and he loved it. We were there all day, every day until late at night. So I think he spent a lot of time with him growing up as a kid. But now that I graduated from college, and I can spend this time with him, and he was much to me to learn class and all these questions of what was life like then, and uh, how does this compare to what you remember? So I want to try and tie that in and see how I can do it. So I'm still thinking through it and figuring out how exactly I'm going to frame the book for writing. But it may be a smaller series where you, know, you may have to have multiple voices. Because I'm some of theirs to get left out, and they may say, well, I'm going to spend four hours with you. And he'd write about it. But I don't want to do that. Of course, not much of a big deal. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite town that you visited? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I guess I say wrong. Now, I don't like to give it a favorite town because you know, every town is so different and every town has great things about it. Some towns, the mayor is working on projects with us, like Kramer's in North Carolina, we were just at this past weekend, too. Oh my gosh, that mayor there is a visionary. I mean, he's just nonsense. And they're going to have, each, he showed us the, the numbers where he's going to have the town for the next five years is going to have be making like a billion dollars because of how successful and how amazing the local growth is right next to Charlotte. But he's just constantly on it doing different things. Other mayors are willing to keep the town the same and revitalize the old buildings, bring it back to what the locals remember it. But if I had to choose like a favorite town that had the most memories, Denver and Emerald Isle might be my favorite beach to go and stay at and visit. Because when I was a kid, we went there all the time. Our whole entire family stayed there. So it, I'm kind of biased to, to say Emerald Isle is a fun beach. But I've been to all the beaches in North Carolina except for three. And those are in two weekends. I'm going to go see the last three beaches Surf City, Topsail, and North Topsail. I've been on all the other beaches. So if you need to find some of the beaches, I can I can about tell you about those two ones. Is my own time? Yes, ma'am. Which club are you looking to do? <laughs> Well, I on screen. So yeah, it'd be great to learn more about how the worship works and, and uh, potentially being able to, to join them because like I mentioned, I some of the greatest local leaders and positive change makers and have some of the greatest ideas of things that can be done here in Wayne County and probably. So anything I can on the boat load just from y'all, your stories and things and advice that you have for me for me. So Yes, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The whole purpose of our appreciation is not our travel, safely, our four weeks that come and have. And your motivation, your need for your project is a very recurring one. So, um, you can use them while you're uh, writing your book. So, Absolutely. thank you. That was yeah. wonderful. And, and I also forgot to mention, I collect a trinket from every town. Every mayor gives me at least something. So I have 
hundreds of items, whether it be ordinance, historical artifacts, all kinds of things that mayors have given me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put this up on the show. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're taking it. That wraps up, or we're going to. Our first meeting of the year with the four way test as usual. So, Rotarians, can y'all rise? And we will all remember together. Of the things we think, say, and do, is it the truth? Is it rare for all of us? Sure. Will we be beneficial to all of us?